In 2019, Sony released the A7R4, and it's the first camera that Chelsea and I have both agreed on it's objectively better than the competition. How did they get there from where they were even just a couple of years ago where their cameras all sucked? We hated Sony cameras. It's actually a pretty amazing story. If you're interested in the camera industry, business strategy, or just want some tips to get ahead of the competition in life, we're going to spend a few minutes recapping the last 20 years or so of Sony's business and how they got to be ahead of Canon and Nikon kind of against all odds. This is the Picture This podcast, and it's brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace makes websites for just about any kind of purpose. I have three. They gave me one. I straight up just paid for the other two, and I'm about to buy number four just for little endeavors that we have going on. We set up a little business for this, or we need a portfolio for this. Bang. We have it set up looking gorgeous in just a few minutes, and it works on just about any type of mobile device. Thanks, Squarespace. Canon and Icon started in the optics and camera businesses before World War II and really blossomed after World War II. We have whole podcasts on the history of Canon, Nikon, and Sony, so be sure to go back to our old podcasting library and listen to those as well. Sony, however, was making a rice cooker, and then toasters, and then the Walkman, and then the PlayStation, and TVs, and all these kinds of consumer electronics. They were also making video cameras for a long time. And in the 90s, they started making their DSC, the little digital super camera, or digital cyber shot. <laughs> That's it. Digital cyber shot. And they were absolutely miserable cameras <laughs> to use. They would like take pictures and write them to a floppy disk or a CD. Geeks absolutely loved them. I was into photography heavily at the time, and I was a nerd, and I played with them, and I despised them. All my nerd friends in the IT department had them though, and I was still shooting with my Canon Elan 2E or the Canon 3, and I was a nerd, but I wasn't drawn into the nerdy appeal of those Sony cameras because I was much more interested in actual results. And I tried it, and the results were terrible. But Sony kept making cameras, and in 2006, they got even more serious by buying Konica Minolta, a company who'd been making cameras for a long, long time. Minolta had the alpha mount, and that's where Sony got the alpha mount from. Minolta had been making SLRs. Canon was making SLRs. Nikon was making SLRs. Everybody was making SLRs. So you know what Sony did? They made an SL. It was like exactly like an SLR, except the little diagonal mirror that bounces light up to your eye, it was semi-translucent. Instead of bouncing light up to your eye, it let light go straight through to the sensor, and instead of having an optical viewfinder that you look through, it had an electronic viewfinder. Sony was actually thinking ahead. Instead of doing what everybody else had done, they thought five, ten years into the future about what technology would be like for digital cameras and they set the marker ahead. And that's business lesson number one. Don't chase the competition. Cut them off. Those SLT cameras were terrible. They were not nearly as good as their SLR counterparts. We tested them. They did not work well. But Sony was investing in the future. They were building out a suite of technologies that they still use today. Those terrible A-mount technologies are part of what put them ahead in 2019. And that's a lesson you can apply to your own personal life as well as your businesses. If you're thinking about a new career, don't go into a career that seems hot right now. Go into a career that's going to be hot in 2024. Okay, imagine some alternate reality where Sony decided to make cameras exactly like Canon and Nikon. They would have been starting out so far behind. They wouldn't have had the complex phase detect system. They wouldn't have had an existing customer base or SLR lenses. They had to distinguish themselves somehow. And they did what they always did best, which was Sony leveraged Sony's own strong suit, their high tech. They had lots of little LCD panels and lots of engineers who could make consumer electronics. So they packed a bunch of consumer electronic gear into those first SLT cameras, the fancy EVF. It was terrible. It made photography so much harder than it had to be, but it was kind of cool. And it kind of made those old optical viewfinders seem like old optical viewfinders. Here's life lesson number two from Sony. Find lazy competitors. At the time, number one in the industry was Canon. Number two was Nikon. And these two had a 
duopoly. You played the game Monopoly, right? At the end of the game, one person owns everything, everybody else is devastated and crying, and well, the reason monopolies are illegal in most places in the world is when you have a monopoly, you can just artificially raise prices and screw over the consumer. So free enterprises depend on this type of competition, but there is kind of a loophole that leads to really lazy industry, and that's a duopoly where you technically don't have a monopoly. Two companies are both in the industry, and technically they're competing, but they come to kind of a non-explicit agreement, and that seems to be what Canon and Nikon were doing. Canon and Nikon each, every year, would release new cameras that seemed practically identical. Some of them, you'd pick them up and the buttons would be in the same places, everything would work exactly the same, the prices would be almost the same. They were both making very healthy profit margins and advancing at a very, very slow pace. Without any new competition in there, those two companies, while technically competing, they'd both become lazy and bloated as if they had won the game Monopoly. Sony evaluated this and they thought, we can actually take these guys on. Now, Sony as a company doesn't always make that sort of decision. For example, Sony makes smartphones and it seems like they backed out of the smartphone market. They decided they were gonna take on Google and Apple, but those are not lazy companies like Canon and Nikon. Those were healthy, fast-moving companies that promptly kicked Sony's butt. But lazy competition isn't enough when they are decades ahead of you. So Sony used another business trick they moved the goalposts. That's lesson number three from this. If you can't win, change the definition of winning. Canon and Nikon had this long history of film cameras where the sensor is whatever role of film you decide to stick in there. They weren't used to competing on things like megapixels or dynamic range, but Sony, they were a tech company. They knew how to make sensors and they still make more sensors than anybody in the world. They used this to their advantage. Canon and Nikon had been marketing based on brand cachet and history and legacy and things like reliability and dependability and service. All super important and practical stuff, especially to pros. But Sony didn't have any of those things. And if you look at their marketing material, they don't ever claim to have the best service or to be the most dependable. Those are all kind of very squishy things. Instead of trying to fight these subjective advantages that the competitors had, Sony went straight objective. And especially if you're marketing to a nerdy audience, objective measurements beat subjective feelings. They went for things you could count. They had 24 megapixels when the competitors had 16. They had 14 stops of dynamic range when the competitors had 13. The competitors focused way better than the Sony cameras, but you know what? The Sony cameras had more autofocus points. <laughs> yes, they were all clustered in the, in the middle and they didn't work worth crap, but you can't put, oh, this focus is pretty good on a full page ad in a magazine. But if you put 247 focusing points there, that's something that will catch a geek's eye. They flooded the industry with all these objective measurements that the competitors couldn't match. And really, even to this day, a lot of people have forgotten about other things that really matter but can't be measured quite so easily. So Sony was winning in ways that you could see and count and measure, but they were losing in every subjective way. And that's part of why we weren't using the cameras because we were shooting professionally and we were going out and actually trying to take pictures and were instantly frustrated with the awful, awful Sony cameras. And the Canon and Nikons just continued to deliver despite the fact that they seemed to be losing in every way that you could count. And that brings us to lesson number four, narrow down your target audience. Five, ten years ago, Sony was not trying to get all those pros at the sidelines at the Super Bowl. They weren't trying to get National Geographic photographers. They were not going for Annie Leibovitz or wedding photographers, these huge industries, these impressive names. Sony was not right for them. Those people would not have liked their cameras. Sony targeted the geeks, the nerds, because they knew the nerds would like the cameras. The nerds would be overly excited about things like an electronic viewfinder or or 100,000 focusing points. And the nerds, well, didn't really take pictures in the real world. They didn't have deliverables because they were enthusiasts. They loved the gear more than the results. That's okay, I'm not here to judge. I'm actually here celebrating what a brilliant business choice this was. Sony knew they could not impress 
professionals with their camera gear at that current point in time, so they didn't even try. They appealed to amateurs, and these amateurs were incredibly enthusiastic, partly because they were nerds. We had this debate all the time. I remember publishing a review of the Canon 7D versus the Sony A6000, and one of the things we tested was this focusing for sports. The Sony's focusing was abysmal, whereas the Canon 7D did amazing. And for our own personal uses, I would have happily switched to Sony if that had been better, but the Canon was way better, so I continued to use that. But a lot of people didn't believe me. Why? Because there were other reviews out there that came up with different results. And this brings me to life lesson number five that I'm going to get to in just one second. But first I wanna say thank you to our sponsor, Squarespace. How you represent yourself online is extremely important and social media should not be front and center for you. Whether you're a photographer or you're a lawyer or a doctor or you're running a business, you don't need somebody flipping through your Facebook or Instagram feed. Setting up your own website with a dedicated domain is incredibly easy. Just head to squarespace.com and get a free trial, no credit card required. Make your website look great. I promise the amazing designer at Squarespace give you a wide library of templates to choose from so you can pick something that matches your own sense of style and personality and then customize it to make it yours. It'll look great on laptops, desktops, mobile devices, whatever people use and you don't have to know anything more about web design. I use and update mine all the time and in fact I just added a store at northropphotography.com and updated my portfolio and it takes only a few minutes and there's never a bug, never a security update. They handle all of that for you. After your free trial, when you're ready to sign up, head to squarespace.com slash Tony and it'll save you 10%. Thanks Squarespace. Back to lesson number five, embrace influencers. Sony did this before any other camera company really did, and it showed up in that example I was just talking about. Chelsea and I had made this very detailed comparison of the 7D and the A6000, and the A6000 just lost miserably and sincerely. Somebody else, another YouTuber, had made the same comparison and come to a completely different conclusion, that somehow the A6000 focused way better. I think history has kind of confirmed our results there, but it didn't really matter. Because in the modern world, there is no right or wrong. If you look up, is the earth round? You'll find lots of things saying the earth is round and lots of things saying the earth is flat. And you know what most people will do? They'll rely on confirmation bias. They will look at these different results and the one that they'll believe is the one that they kind of already believe. People just try to find somebody who agrees with what they already think and then they love that person. In 2019, if your product is worse, but somebody people trust says it's better, your product's better. The opposite is true too. Influencers can work against you. Sony really reached out to YouTubers, including myself, before anybody else. It was the Sony A6300 release, and it's not a great camera. Not something we bought or ever recommended to anybody. But they reached out to us, they invited us out there, and they got it in our hands. They started the discussion with us. They had their engineers there solving the problems that they could. They were training us on how to get the most out of it, and maybe more importantly, they were actually listening to us, and we would complain about things, and you would see the problems fixed very shortly. Like, we were the first people, I think, to discover that the Sony A6300 overheated all the time. We published those results and in just like six months, Sony released a whole new camera, the A6500. That pretty much was exactly the same thing, except it fixed that problem and I think it added a touch screen, something we also complained about. Sony deeply and successfully engaged with influencers. They didn't simply hire them to read off their marketing material. And to confirm, we've never accepted money or free gear from Sony or any other camera manufacturer. We want to remain unbiased. But Sony talked and we listened and more importantly, we talked and Sony listened. And since then, we've been to press events for all the manufacturers, but Sony still kind of does it best. When we say something doesn't work, they don't get mad and cut us off for six months or a year. No, they just keep communicating. They understand that unless you straight up buy a review, there's going to be positives and minuses. They also understand the most valuable influencers are the ones that can't be bought, like us, because those are the ones that people come to and trust. What's the result of the strategy? Well, the Nikon F mount was released in the 50s. The Sony E mount, by comparison, was released in 2010. It's only been nine years since this mount was released, and now 
Sony is the number one full frame camera maker in this market and they seem to be taking over everything. This A7R4 here has its share of serious flaws. You'll hear all about them in the review that's coming soon, so subscribe to see that. But at the same time, it's solidly two generations of Canon and Nikon's mirrorless cameras right now. And now they're the ones playing catch up. And even now in 2019, it doesn't seem like they've learned the most important lessons from the competitor because now they're just playing catch up and they're kind of still playing the same old games that they always have. I wish them well because more than anything, I love the art of photography, creating images. I love what photography does for people, giving people a place to put their creative energy, giving them an outlet for the feelings, a way to capture memories forever or to make art. Photography is boundless and important, far more important than the camera gear. And for that reason, I don't care if the winner is Sony or Canon or Nikon or Fuji or somebody else, but I do care that photography continues to progress. I hope you like this podcast. If you like digging deeper into photography, be sure to listen to our picture this podcast while you drive or work out or edit photos. And be sure to support our sponsor, Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com, get a free trial, set up a website that will look and work great and represent you to the rest of the world in the best, most beautiful and professional way possible. If you love it, head to squarespace.com slash Tony and you'll get a 10% discount. If you're watching on YouTube, write a comment down below because I'd love to hear the parts of this that you disagree with. I'd like to see where you think Sony's strategy went right or wrong and how Canon and Nikon can strike back and actually catch up. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to see more videos from us, including very soon forthcoming review of the Sony a7R4.